Well, good morning again. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to be a fully engaged Christian. And uh, if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, we'll be there in, in just a minute to read a paragraph there. Uh, I've been a Christian for 75% of my life. It's almost exactly 75% if you total up all the days and years. And uh, for probably the first, I don't know, third of that 75%, the, the first 10 years or so that I lived as a Christian, uh, I had some misunderstandings of the Christian faith. They, they weren't necessarily incorrect completely. They just weren't full pictures of what it means to be a Christian. And because I didn't have a full picture of what it means to be a Christian, I, I wasn't fully engaged as a Christian. Because I had a, a partial picture of the faith, I lived in some ways as kind of a partial Christian. And I think that there are lots of people in the church today who live this way, which is why I want to talk to you about it this morning. Let me explain kind of the misperceptions that I had of my faith when I was just starting as a Christian. You see, the first image that really kind of captivated or, or, or kind of consumed my understanding of the Christian faith is that of a gravestone. Because when I first started to understand the Christian faith, I thought that the Christian faith was primarily concerned with what happens after we die. Now, this kind of perception was taught to me first by my parents when they taught me the most horrific and horrifying bedtime prayer known to man. Every night my parents would take me into, into my bedroom and they were trying to be really good parents and they wanted to teach me how to pray. And so we would kneel next to my bed and we would pray this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's, it's okay so far, but then it gets terrifying. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then my parents would get up, turn the lights off, shut the door, and leave me as this little child scared to death that this was going to be the night that I would meet my demise. <laughs> to make matters worse, our house was just down the road from the state prison. And every once in a while, someone would break out of that place and they would make their way down our road and some of them would hide in the bushes in front of our house. And search helicopters, literally, would fly down our road with searchlights and they would shine into my bedroom window. And I would think to myself, this is it. It's all coming to an end tonight. Now this idea that Christian faith is really about what happens after we die wasn't just taught to me in this bedtime prayer, though, though it, it started there because I, I always wondered, uh, well, maybe if I do die tonight, can I be sure God would accept me? Right? That was kind of the reinforcing lesson of that prayer. But then my youth leaders and, and children's workers at our church, they taught us that there were two questions that everybody needs to be able to answer. And the first one is, if you were to die tonight, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven and you'd spend eternity there? And if you did die tonight, question number two, and you found yourself standing in front of God, what would you tell God so that he would welcome you into heaven? Because... Christian faith is primarily about what happens after we die. Well, as a young teenage boy, I decided I didn't want to go to the other place after I died. I wanted to go to heaven. And so I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I accepted his gift of eternal life in heaven after I die. Now, I want to just make it real clear that I actually do believe that there is a heaven and there is a hell. I do believe that we will spend an eternity either with God or separated from Him. I 100% believe that. I don't want to give you any impression that I believe otherwise. But what I do know about the Christian faith is that Jesus isn't just concerned about what happens after we die. He's concerned about that. It, it is a concern. 
But it's not the only concern that Jesus has. You see, for a long time, I thought God's main goal was to get as many people as possible to believe in him so that someday he could evacuate as many of us as possible from this earth into his heaven. But then I actually read the Gospels. And what I discovered when I read the Gospels is, number one, Jesus doesn't talk an awful lot about that. He doesn't say, come follow me so you can go to heaven. He doesn't say, come follow me so you can escape hell. He doesn't say, come follow me so that everything will be okay when you die. Jesus actually just invites people to follow him because he's worth following. And he was concerned not just about getting people into heaven. He was concerned about getting heaven into this earth. This is why he comes. In fact, the very first words that Jesus speaks in the gospel is that there's good news. And the good news isn't that you get to go to heaven when you die. The good news is that the kingdom of God has come here. And it's accessible. You can actually enter into the kingdom of God and live in its reality. And when he taught his disciples how to pray, he told them to pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus isn't just concerned about getting us into heaven, though one day we get to spend eternity with him in his presence. And it's going to be wonderful. But between now and then, God is just concerned with our lives being consumed with the ethic of heaven so that when we live our lives, wherever we go and whatever we're doing, we are bringing heaven into this earth so that our homes and our families and the streets we live on and the schools that we attend and the businesses where we work and the places where we go for entertainment, they all begin to be transformed and look more and more like the kingdom of God. See, this is, this is what God wants. This is what God desires. Now, I mentioned that my limited perspective on the faith uh, made me a limited Christian, right? Because here's why. When, when I thought that Christian faith was primarily concerned about what happens after I die, and then I accepted Jesus, I actually thought that I had crossed the finish line, right? I had a problem. I was a sinner. I was separated from God. And because I was a sinner separated from God, I couldn't make it into heaven. But once I put my faith in Jesus, my sins were forgiven. I was made right with God. And now I'm in. Right? So I crossed the finish line. Now here's the problem with that perspective. Coming to faith in Jesus is not the finish line. It is the beginning of of a whole journey of learning to live our lives as if Jesus were living our lives in the place where we find ourselves. That's the goal of the Christian journey. And that takes time. It's day by day. It's moment by moment. Living out the Christian life and becoming more and more like Jesus. But because I thought I'd crossed the finish line, I kind of I kind of thought it was cool to just maybe sit back. I mean, Jesus doesn't need me to change, does he? I believe in him. I've accepted him. I'm in. I'm going to heaven when I die. What else is there? Right? And so we just kind of sit back and we're less engaged than we need to be in the mission of God and in the work of God because of our perspective on the faith. And again, I probably spent the first 10 years of my Christian journey thinking this way until I started reading the Gospels again and asking God to help me understand what he required of me. And as I started to discover that, what I realized is that Jesus is looking for people who are fully engaged, who don't just have a narrow picture of the Gospel, because the picture I had is part of the picture. It's not wrong. It's not incorrect. It's just limited. And I needed to broaden my picture of the faith so that I could step into the full reality of the Christian life that God was calling me to. 
There's a paragraph that I want to share with you from a letter that this first century church leader by the name of Paul wrote to a group of Christians. And this group of Christians were positioned in the city of Corinth. And Corinth was kind of an interesting place because there were uh, kind of temples to all kinds of gods. And there was all kinds of pagan behavior. It was a port and there were people that would travel in and out of the city. And so it was kind of a metropolitan area with all different kinds of people living all different kinds of lifestyles. And in the middle of this kind of eclectic society, there was a group of Christians and they had their own issues to be sure. Just read Paul's letters to them and you'll see some of the issues. They, they struggled. They had divisions. They, they, they had sin that sometimes would crop up in the church. But they were trying to live faithfully for Jesus. And Paul writes in his second letter to this group, 2 Corinthians. And, and in the middle of chapter 5, there's a paragraph. And the paragraph speaks to this idea of full engagement. What does it look like for Christians living in the midst of what is in many ways a secular, pagan, uh, other gods kind of environment? What does it look like for a Christian in that environment to be fully engaged in the Christian journey? And so we're going to read this paragraph and then we're going to unpack it together just for a few minutes this morning. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you have a Bible, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. This is what it says. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me before we dig into this passage together? God, I know we've already prayed in this service, but we're just pausing again to first and foremost thank you for your word. I pray in these next few moments that your Holy Spirit would have your way in this place. Speak to us. We, your servants, are listening. And as we hear your voice, God, make us quick to obey and respond to whatever it is you are asking us to do. And for what you do in these next few moments, God, we are going to give you the thanks and the praise. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three things that I think are part of living a fully engaged Christian life that Paul talks about when he writes this letter to these Christians. And the first is that we would surrender fully. That we would surrender fully. You cannot be a fully engaged Christian un until you take everything that you know about yourself and you surrender all of it fully to everything that you know about God. Paul starts this paragraph by saying, in essence, this is what Christianity is. It is about this reality that this man named Jesus Christ, this son of God who became fully human flesh, he died for us so that those of us who still live would no longer live for ourselves, but instead we would live fully for him. This is full surrender. 
And we cannot be fully engaged Christians. We cannot enter into everything that God has for us until we come to this place of full surrender. Right? And there are so many times that we walk through our Christian journey and we want to give everything to God, but there are also some things we'd like to keep for ourselves. Right? And, and, and we find ourselves maybe with one foot fully in and one foot fully out. On the fence. Right? Except that's not how it works. We have to be all in with Jesus. We don't get to put, put one foot in and keep our money for ourselves. We don't get to put one foot in and keep our entertainment choices for ourselves, right? Like live for Jesus in every area of your life, but then when it comes to entertainment, there are no rules. Do whatever you want, right? We can't put one foot in and, and keep our relationships for ourselves or our bad habits for ourselves or our bad patterns of behavior for ourselves. No, it all has to go on the altar. We have to be all in, that's what Jesus requires. Why? Because he gave his life for us. That's what he invites us into. In another letter, Paul's writing about this in, in the book of Galatians. And he says that uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, the reality is, is that if we're going to be Christians, we have to come to that place where we have died to ourself and we are living fully for Jesus, holding nothing back. This is why baptism is such an important act and it was so good for me to hear you talking about baptism. Baptism is not just some ritual that we perform. It is an actual sacrament where we go into the waters and the Holy Spirit of God meets us in those waters and we go down in the water and we are buried with Christ. And when we come up out of the water, we are raised again to new life. Just like it says in Romans chapter 6. Because we have to die to ourselves so that we can live fully for Jesus. Full surrender. And you might find yourself this morning thinking to yourself, you know what, there are some things that I'm holding back. Right? There are some things that I'm holding back. And you need to give those to Jesus today. You can't keep them for yourself. You've got to be all in or you can't be fully engaged. Right? It all starts there. But there's other things that Paul talks about in this letter. We get down to verse 17 and what we discover is that anyone who comes to faith in Christ, anyone who goes all in, that person is a brand new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. And we should just pause here for a moment to say that some of you might need to hear this today. Because you may have walked into this room and you may be carrying a weight on your shoulders. Right? You're here and, and you know that there are patterns of behavior in your life. There are choices that you've made. There are relationships that you're engaged in. There are things that are part of your journey right now that, that maybe the people around you already know about, but maybe they don't. Maybe you've done a really good job of hiding it from them, but you know it's there. And you're carrying that weight today, the weight of choices and, and patterns of behavior and, and things that are broken and wrong in your life. This is one of the things I love about the Christian faith is that when you step up, not to the finish line, but the starting line of a journey with Christ, in that moment, whatever that weight is, Jesus takes it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how broken or bad it is. Jesus will take it from you and you will be a brand new creation. You get a fresh start, a clean slate, a brand new beginning. And some of you need to let that weight go today. And it just takes an act of simple faith of saying, Jesus, I am giving it all to you. And in that moment, Jesus will take the weight away. Now, I mentioned that it's not a finish line, it's a starting line. Because when you come to faith in Jesus, you're a new creation. But if you look at verse 21, there's a goal 
for the Christian journey. And Paul's talking about it. He's talking about the fact that when you come to faith, you're a brand new creation. But the end goal in verse 21 is that you would become the very righteousness of God. It's not just that Jesus wants to forgive your sins. Jesus actually wants to make you free from the need to live in any of those patterns of behavior in an ongoing way. He actually wants to make you victorious over those things and change you so that you become a brand new person who looks just like Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the Christian journey. Which brings me to the second aspect of this whole fully engaged Christian life. We have to surrender fully, but we also have to pursue transformation. We have to pursue transformation. This is what we're called to, right? Part of the reason I wasn't a fully engaged Christian is because I thought I had everything I was supposed to have from God. Because I I had kind of my ticket to heaven. Right? If, if you've ever seen some of those crazy church signs like free tickets to heaven inside, if you have a church sign, don't ever put that on your church sign. It's ridiculous. But, but, but some churches do that, and it's kind of silly, right? Because that's not what the Christian faith is for, just a free ticket to heaven. But I thought that's what the Christian faith was about. That was a misunderstanding. And because I had my free ticket to heaven, I thought I had everything I was supposed to have. And yet there is this call of God to become holy even as I am holy. To be transformed and to live in freedom over sin in my life. To not live the way I used to live. And I needed to pursue that. And I wasn't in the first 10 years of my journey. I was just kind of hanging out. Got my ticket. I'm in. What it means to be a fully engaged Christian is to realize it's not just about getting into heaven. It is about letting the life of heaven absolutely 100% transform every single thing about your life. Not just your behaviors, But your mindset, your attitudes, your words, your relationships, the way that you treat people, even your inclinations and the way that the most inner part of your being is bent, that over time, instead of being bent away from God, it would be bent toward God and you would want to pursue Him more and more and more. We need this message in the church today because we have a church full of people. Not, I'm not talking about your church. I'm talking about the church. We have a church full of people who are not being transformed. Which is why the world looks in and says, oh, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Because a lot of us are. We say we believe in Jesus. We say Jesus changes lives. And yet so many people sitting in church today all across North America aren't pursuing transformation. Research has been done which shows that the behaviors and attitudes and ethics of the world don't look that much different from the behaviors and attitudes and ethics of the church. We got a problem. And the problem is not the problem with the world. The problem is we as Christians must be fully engaged because we're not holding anything back from God anymore. We're all in and because we're all in, we're going to pursue this journey of holiness. We're going to dig into the scriptures, not to say we did our religious duty for the day. We're digging into the scriptures because we want to meet with God and we want God to speak his words of life into us so that we become different people. And we don't pray just so we can say we fulfilled our obligation. No, we pray and we commune with God because we want to build a relationship with Him because we want to know who He is and how He thinks and what's important to Him. And we need that in our lives. Right? We have to pursue transformation. We have to be faithful to do the things that only we can do. Get in the Word. Be people of prayer. And then we must be completely dependent on God to do what only He can do. Change our hearts and our lives and make us different people. We have to be fully surrendered. We have to pursue transformation. And then third, we have to live missionally. I love the way Paul lays it out in this paragraph. He sets the tone by saying, we've got to be fully surrendered. We don't live for ourselves. We live for the one who died for us. 
right? And then he says, you're a new creation, becoming the righteousness of God. And in between those two bookends, you are Christ's ambassadors. Right? While you're on this journey from new creation to the righteousness of God, while you're pursuing transformation, at the very same time, you have to multitask as a fully engaged Christian. You have to pursue transformation and you have to be a minister of reconciliation. It's your job to get between people who don't know Jesus and Jesus and you have to have a relationship with people who don't know Jesus so you can introduce them because they know you and it's your job as a minister of reconciliation to know them and introduce them to Jesus so they can know Jesus like you know Jesus. That's what it means to be a minister of reconciliation. You've been given, Paul says, the message of reconciliation. And here's the message in case you forgot it. God doesn't count people's sins against them. He's reconciling the world to himself in Christ. That's the message that you've been given. And guess what? You have to share that message. A friend of mine, Dwight Robertson, says it this way. Uh, you are God's plan A and there is no plan B. Right? And, and I think it's important for us to feel the weight of that. Right? Our world will not come to know Jesus if we don't tell them. Your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, some of your family members who don't know Jesus, they won't know if you don't tell them. No one can believe unless they hear and no one can hear unless someone proclaims and no one can proclaim unless they are sent. Romans chapter 10. And for a long time in the church, we've thought the people who were sent are the people that we pay. Right? The pastors, they're the minister of reconciliation because they've been to school and they've got a theology degree and, and they know how to preach. At least we hope. Right? I mean, I go to a different church every week and sometimes, right, they don't know how to preach that well, right? It's just part of it, right? But here's the reality. You're all preachers. You're all preachers. And we've missed this in the church. We've missed this. 50 or 100 years ago, we decided to say we have the minister. And we lost the fact that we're all ministers. And because of that, we have churches full of people who come every Sunday. They show up, they sit, they hang out. And then they go back home and they do whatever they want to do with their lives. But being on mission isn't part of the game for them. And in the middle of all of that, we have a world that's getting farther and farther away from God and a church which is becoming less influential in our culture. And so if you look at those two trends, the population's growing with people who don't know who God is and the church is getting smaller in our culture. We have less influence. And we call this in the Wesleyan church the gospel gap. And we need every single person every single person who claims the name of Jesus to share the message of Jesus with the people God has put in your life. It's the only way to close the gap. And if you want to be a fully engaged Christian, you've got to be all in. You've got to be growing to look more and more like Christ from new creation to the righteousness of God. And you've got to be engaged in mission. So let me just, as we close, give you four ways that you can be engaged in mission. I'm going to do this very quickly. First, identify. Just simply write down a name or two or three or ten, if God gives you that many names, of the people that you know at your work, at your school, in your home, your neighborhood, who are far away from God, who don't know who Jesus is or aren't living in relationship with him, just write down those names. Identify them. Secondly, intercede. Intercede, just a fancy word. 
um, that I chose because it starts with the letter I and it fits in this list. Okay? It's okay to laugh. I'm, I'm kind of joking around here. Intercede's a fancy word that just means you're going to get in between. You're going to get in between those people that you wrote down when you identified that list. You're going to get in between them and God. And you're going to talk to God about the people on your list. And you're going to ask God to give you opportunities so that you can talk to those people about God. Intercede. Identify, intercede. Third, you need to invest. You need to invest. Build relationships. If there are things that they like to do and you like to do, do them together. Share a meal. Invite them into your home. Right? If there are things that they like to do, as long as they're not illegal or immoral uh, and, and you like to do them, do them with them. And if you don't like to do them, again, as long as they're not illegal or immoral, just pretend that you like to do them. Right? I'm married. There are things my wife likes to do that I don't particularly enjoy. But because I love her, I pretend. I'm not dumb. Right? Invest. Invest. Right? Because if we invest, we build a platform so that the fourth thing can happen, and that's that we invite. And that could mean invite to church, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to challenge you to think a bit differently, not just invite them to church. Share your story with them and invite them to Jesus. They don't need to come to church to accept Jesus. You can lead them. You know Jesus. Make that introduction and invite them to take that step. And listen, we're all ambassadors. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador. The only question is, how well are you representing him to a lost world? Right? And again, we've heard it said before, you know, uh, Go out and preach to the world. And if necessary, use words. I just want to remind you, it is necessary. Use words. Living for Jesus is not enough in our culture. It's not enough. You have to actually open up your mouth and testify about him. Because there are people you interact with on a daily basis who have never heard about him. And while they might look at your life and think you're a really good person, they need to hear about Jesus. And you're where you are because you're the person that's supposed to tell them. So I want to challenge you today, before I pray for you, to consider becoming a fully engaged Christian. Is there anything in your life that you're holding back from God? Give it to Him. Your money, your time, your talents, your relationships, your entertainment, whatever it is, just give it to Him. He died for you. Give everything to Him. Are you pursuing transformation or are you under the assumption that you're in? What else could God want from me? He wants you to become like Jesus. And the journey of the faith is becoming more and more like Jesus day by day, moment by moment. And then I want to challenge you to live missionally. You're an ambassador. Represent him well. Live in those places where God has put you as if Jesus were living his life in your place. And open up your mouth and proclaim his gospel so people can know him. I'd like to invite you to just bow your heads and close your eyes as we close this time. And all I want to ask you to do uh, with nobody looking around, because this is really uh, just between you and the Lord and me, because I'm going to pray for you. So I'm looking. But if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, God has spoken to me about surrendering something today, and I'm going to do that. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything like that. I just, I just want you to raise your hand just to acknowledge before God, there's something I need to surrender, and I'm going to do that. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Anybody in here, you can put your hands down now. Anybody in here who says, you know what? There's something I need to do specifically as it relates to pursuing transformation. I kind of thought I was in and everything was okay, but, but I actually do need to become more like Jesus. And I want to actually say before God, I, I'm in for that. I want to take that journey. Who, who would raise their hand and say, that's me this morning? Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. And then finally, uh, you can put your hands down. Uh, anybody here this morning says, you know what, I'm challenged because I'm not living missionally like I should. There are people in my life that maybe need to be reached and I need to do a better job of actually representing Christ to them. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Yeah, hands are going up. Yeah, yeah. So God, you've seen these hands. And God, there are people in all three categories this morning, people who want to surrender, people who want to pursue transformation, people who want to live missionally. God, what I pray for all of my brothers and sisters in this room today is that you would pour out your Spirit on them. Meet them right where they are in this place of commitment. Do your work in them. Do your work through them. God, don't let them hold anything back from you transform them into the very righteousness of God and help them represent you well so that more people can know who you are. And God, for everything that you accomplish in us and through us, may you get all of the glory because you are God and you are worthy. Pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. Can you join me in thanking Chris for sharing with us this morning? Thank you. Uh, as you go today, if you'd like to pray with somebody, there'll be a couple people from our prayer response team right here afterwards. You're welcome to come up and ask them to pray for anything you'd like. Even if it was processing a little bit more of what we talked about this morning in the service, you can do that. If you have a communication card, um, if you're a guest or any other things that you want to share, I just want to remind you to drop that off at the welcome table, take a gift with you. Would you stand together? And now may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go. You are sent. <clears throat>